Are you ready for another wood turning program? The following show, we will be connecting live with Alan and Lauren from the USA. They will show us how to turn and decorate a pendant. Lauren and I are hobbyist wood turners. We live in Northern New Jersey and uh, we have way too many interests, but wood turning is one of them. And we've been involved with World Wood Day for a couple of years, uh, doing some live streaming from Austria a couple of years ago. And this is the first time we're demonstrating for World Wood Day. And this is sort of an abbreviated demonstration. Uh, normally we demonstrate to wood turning clubs, people that are already familiar with wood turning and want to know how we make the jewelry that we make. And so today we're going to be giving a little bit of an overview. Normally we're a two and a half or three hour demo. We're going to try to cut this down to about an hour, show you a few things that we do, not dive too much into the tools and the techniques, but show you a little bit of uh, what's going on here. Um, Lauren, you want to just introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, I'm married to Alan for 46 years and, and uh, we've been having a lot of fun with the uh, would be uh, wood turning and making jewelry, which is kind of a new thing for us. Um, absolutely love that. We are so delighted to be here for World Wood Day and uh, happy to demonstrate for you. Now, <clears throat> Lauren and I have demonstrated at symposia and such, and Lauren is mostly known for her embellishment with archival inks, and you'll see uh, some examples of that uh, pretty soon. And uh, But Lauren does turn. So let me just show you this uh, little uh, video. And this video will show you not only her turning something, but um, you'll see the result of that in a few moments. So here she's turning a sphere. And yeah, she's using a jig that uh, helps make sure that it's going to be perfectly spherical. And then she's going to uh, do some hollowing. Uh, I believe it's in here. Yeah. So here is one method of doing some hollowing, uh, in this case, using a laser. But more often than not, we use a video technique. But this just lets people know that she's not all about ink. She actually has her own lathe and, uh, and can do all of that stuff. But I'm also all about canvas, and I like to draw in some decor for the theater, and uh, that's my goal. So the faster that I can get my pieces done so that I can play with them, the better. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some, some photos, because when you get an idea of the type of work that we do, you'll have a, a better idea of why we use the techniques that we use. So first of all, we want to talk a little bit about personal uh, protection equipment. Um, Lauren and I are very much about personal protection equipment. In fact, uh, we did, uh, Lauren narrated a video for the AAW, the American Association of Woodturners, on personal protection equipment for woodturners. Um, I ride a motorcycle. And there are people that will ride a motorcycle in a t-shirt and flip-flops. I'm not that guy. And actually, let me drop myself back into the corner here. And so when, when we're in their shop, we simply do not turn on the lathe until our dust collectors are on and our respirator helmets are on. We know that this is one extreme view, but we're very protective of our lungs and our hearing and our eyesight. And so this becomes very important to us. So enough of that. So when we started making pendants, we started using some really beautiful wood. This is a Buckeye Burl. And this is from a stabilized bottle stopper blank that, uh, that is very easy for wood turners uh, to get hold of. And the thing is, when you have a beautiful piece of wood like this, when you have something with a lot of figure and a lot of grain, as a wood turner, you want to stay out of its way. You want to make a nice shape for it. So we've got a flat back and a convex front, and you want to drill a hole in it and make a simple necklace. But it's not, it's not all about you. It's not about what you can do. It's about showing off the wood uh, best way as possible. Now, one of the nice things about this is that 
you can get a lot of uh, pieces of jewelry out of a very little bit of wood. I have a wood turner friend who does bowls. He says, I throw off shavings bigger than many of the projects that you and Lauren work on. And he's absolutely right. So here I had something that was about an eighth of an inch thick. Well, maybe, maybe a quarter, must have been about an eighth of an inch thick. And it had a little break in the middle. So I drilled out the hole where the, where the occlusion was. And I rather liked the offset hole. And because it, it seemed to work well here. And if I zoom in a little bit, you'll see it looks almost like a satellite photo of uh, clouds and, and all of that. So I really rather like the way this looks. And when we started getting into this, um, this offset hole, we started thinking that, oh, we could do things with that. So I tried to make another one like that and it broke. And so I glued it back together and put it back on the lathe and it broke again and it broke again. And we said, well, you know, this is not going to be a, uh, a circle with a hole drilled in it. So I drilled a bigger hole in it and um, uh, made it into a crescent shape, which Lauren attached what they call findings. These are uh, jewelry pieces that help connect pieces to one another. And so she made this into a, a necklace that she wore to a, uh, a black tie wedding. But once we have a hole in these things, we can put things into it. So here we had a larger offset hole and we put some, uh, some beads into it. And this was, uh, I think this was uh, Jasper and the necklace I think is uh, uh, jade or, or what is it, Lauren? Chinese turquoise. Chinese, Chinese turquoise. turquoise. All right, I'll, I'll get it straight eventually. We've only been describing this for five years now. Um, and similarly, this is a piece of uh, black and white ebony with a very nice stripe running through it and the kind of design decisions you make are where you're gonna put the stripe. Now, one of the things that we started doing was uh, doing embellishment. So Lauren, why don't you talk about this piece? Okay, well, this piece uh, was done originally with pyrography, which are heated pens that you burn into the wood so you can make lines and design. So I started uh, doing that um, and uh, used squares and, and uh, circles and, and uh, let's see, squares and triangles. Thank you. <laughs> and it was fine. It was, it was looking pretty good, but it needed something. And when you're making jewelry, you have to realize that people are going to look at it very closely and they're going to wear it, they're going to hold it. You want to make it really interesting. So the more you do to it, the better off, the more texture you get, the more interesting it becomes. And uh, it just seems to grow that way. So that's the approach that I use. It's not the less is more approach. It's the more is more approach. So what I did was I used some Black India ink to uh, make it pop more. Uh, and then it needed something else. So I burned in some little dots. And Alan calls it my giraffe pendant. And uh, I, I think it worked out really well. So, okay, Alan. so one of the things that we do a lot of is we try to design things, as you saw with the offset hole, we try to design areas to put things in. So one of the, the two pieces that I'm going to be showing you today uh, for the wood turning portion of it, one is going to be working a piece of uh, burl like, uh, like I showed a little earlier. And the other is uh, this piece of maple where we're going to show you how we turn a raised bead. And the reason for this is that I want to give Lauren areas that she can draw in. And you'll notice that uh, the wood has some rather nice grain lines, which Lauren's going to work with. And uh, so you'll see that. And examples of what she does with this would be uh, things like this, where, where she'll do different uh, patterns and letting some of the wood show through so that, um, uh, that it becomes a it's wooden piece. Color. Yeah, it's another it's color. A part, it's a part of it, it's another color. And also do the backs because these things tend to flip around unless you're using a pin, making it like a brooch. Um, they do flip around and we like having a flat side and a convex side. 
And so here, let me take myself out. Lauren, you want to talk about these? Sure, these are four different uh, pendants, two of which the top, the top two use the grain of the wood as my design element. So what I'll do is I will take a pen and draw in the grain of the wood and from there try to figure out what the design's supposed to be, um, what it's telling me it wants to be. So what we're looking for, for is wood that has a very tight grain so that your pen doesn't sink into it. Um, and it should be light so that any of the inks that I use uh, would, would show up better. And uh, it, it, um, I, 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 well, I, would, I would definitely uh, use the grain lines. The bottom two, I completely ignore the grain lines and just do a design. So uh, I, I do that all, I think the grain lines are used most of the time. So not everything is jewelry. Sometimes we make things like uh, a shaving brush or uh, Lauren did uh, brush. these, uh, yeah, makeup brush or uh, she turned uh, these eggs. Well, it's, this is one egg, but a couple of different views of the egg. And uh, so there's all sorts of things going on here. There's a little uh, snake coiled in there and there's all sorts of patterns and, and such. And Lauren will talk about some of these patterns when she when we flip over to her about the, um, uh, about the techniques that she uses. And this was the sphere that we showed you that she was turning in that initial video. And so this sphere was uh, turned into the shape of a sphere, then it was hollowed and then she pierced it. And then she did the ink work on the outside and then she painted the inside. And this was the first time, this was a couple of years ago. This was the very first sphere that Lauren ever turned, hollowed, pierced. <laughs> and uh, one thing that she learned very quickly was that it takes an awful lot longer to do the ink work on a sphere than it does on a pendant because there's so much more surface area. Alan? Yes? Apparently my mic is too quiet. Your mic is too quiet. At the chat. That's what they said. Lauren's too quiet or Alan's too loud. Well, that that's kind of like the story of my life here. All right. I, I just made I just <laughs> yeah, made that's Lauren. That's who we are, actually. <laughs> I just made is Lauren louder. Better? Well, okay. you won't be able to, you won't be able to tell for a couple of minutes. So remember, we're not real time, Lauren. All right. All right. So I okay, I just uh, boosted Lauren's audio. And I can turn my audio down, certainly. In fact, let me just do that. Uh, I'm just turning down a little bit. Okay, so here are some examples of some spheres that we do. Uh, spheres are another term, uh, with, the technical term is dust collectors because you put them up on the shelf and they collect dust. Um, <laughs> but, but the bottom two uh, stands that they're on are actually uh, done, I, I designed uh, the one on the left, uh, at, it, and these were done with wood filament on 3D printers. And uh, it's, it's kind of interesting to me to create things on the 3D printer that are uh, part wood and part resin that would be difficult, if not impossible, to do with uh, conventional uh, woodworking. And uh, so if I just give you a very, very quick look at this so you can see what this looks like. So you can see how this uh, how this prints. And then if I jump, jump ahead here, it's say to a bowl. And so this was actually with wood filament. It was running around and around and around. And it was one continuous strand of wood-based filament that's melted and then uh, just put into, uh, uh, it just builds it up one layer at a time. So we like doing yeah, things like really that. Yeah, it's really hard to get anything that thin in wood turning. Yeah, I, I can turn a relatively thin bowl, but that one was four tenths of one millimeter yeah. thick. And and similarly, we use uh, 3D printing to design things like the stand. Uh, the stand was actually done with uh, with a uh, metal impregnated filament. And uh, so, but these are examples of some of the the spheres that we've done. I have a community called Lucid Wood Turners, which is all about uh, people using technology. Um, for uh, wood turning. 
So Lauren, I'm going to switch back over to you uh, while I uh, set up in the next room. So why don't you talk a little bit about what you're up to? Okay. What I am up to. All righty. Am I on? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, well, this being World Wood Day and the theme of World Wood Day being CO2 and wood, which makes everything grow and produces oxygen for us and stuff like that, I'm trying to figure out how to incorporate that into a pendant. And it's, it's just how do you show something that's odorless, colorless, uh, you know, you can't see it, you can't, you know, whatever. So how do you, how do you show it? So I did some drawing. Um, let's see, come back on four. There we go. Okay, I've just been playing with some drawings here, trying to figure out, okay, is it swirly? Is it bubbly? Would it be? Uh, I'm not sure. So go back to number one. There we go. I've decided that I'm going to do a whole bunch of trees around and the middle will have the airy kind of gassy stuff, but there's also a lot of uh, roots of the trees in there. So I'm going to be playing around in the, with that and I'll show you how to do that. Um, let's see. And Alan actually did a raised bead for me here that's going to be more interesting. And what I did was I started laying it out in pencil and you can work with pencil with the inks. Uh, I use ink pens uh, because I find that using anything this small needs something very precise. So I use really small pointed pens that have a point tip and they also have brushes. So I can really get into the area in different colors. And we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, let's go back to number four for a minute. Okay. And these are, are you zoomed in on that? Signs. Lauren, are you zoomed in on that camera? Yeah. Okay. Uh, as far as I know, yeah. Okay, okay. Am I not? No, no, okay. it's okay. These are some some of them. This was actually done with a, looking at the grain of the wood. And I do the backs. And Alan mentioned the types of uh, findings. And this one will definitely flip on you, especially if you're a little busty like me. But then I also do findings. This is a combination pin back and burl so that I can put a chain through it and that won't go nearly as much turning as it would otherwise. And this one is a work in progress with a design and I outlined all of the grain. So we'll figure out what it wants to be. I'm not quite sure what it's telling me. So then I have another set here. This one was really interesting because it had a really interesting grain line. So that was fun. I don't think, oh, I did do the back. <laughs> okay. So where, where do you want to go from here, Mr. Allen? All right. What I will do is I will switch over to, um, to my camera here. And I'll talk about some tools here. And then when I come back, Lauren, you can talk about a couple of the tools. You can show a couple of your, uh, your pens and sure. such. So mm -hmm. I'm in the, the next room. Our, our shop is... Um, in the basement. In fact, I'll show you something. Uh, uh, I'm in a basement shop, and Lauren's on the second floor of our uh, of our home. So we are not even <laughs> close to each other right now. So what we generally do when we're teaching wood turners is that we show them the tools that we use. But I just wanted to give you a little overview of some of the tools. Um, this would be an example of a bottle stopper blank uh, that's been stabilized. And so stabilized wood is when a wood is very soft or called punky, it's, it would crumble or be too hard to turn. So what, what is done is it's impregnated with resin uh, under a vacuum and then allowed to harden or baked. And so it, it stabilizes the wood. And so we get things that you can also uh, invoke, uh, put in dye. So this one here is a, a piece of, uh, of burl that's been dyed green. Um, this one here, 
is uh, uh, some pink ones that we had dyed for us. We thought it'd be very nice for some uh, breast cancer awareness kinds of things. And so, but what Lauren's gonna be working with is some maple. And this is quarter inch maple. And what we do is we use a circle template and uh, draw circles and, and mark the centers and such. And then these are going to get mounted onto uh, these plates here, because unlike most of the uh, work that you see, which is going to be uh, spindle work, like for candlesticks and things like that, or bowl work, um, where the, the bowls held in with spur centers or, uh, or a chuck, uh, this is actually going to be held on with, with tape, double-sided tape. And so the rig that we're using is uh, the work's going to get put on to, uh, to this piece here, which gets attached to a backing plate. And here's what it looks like assembled. And this backing plate has a bunch of different holes in it so that I can do it on center or offset. And you'll see the reason for, one of the reasons for offset. Uh, one reason is that you might want to scribe some lines at different, um, different offsets, but we're gonna use that offset just to demonstrate uh, drilling a hole. Um, and this plate is held onto the lathe by screwing on to a mandrel and the mandrel fits into the headstock of the chuck. Now, because as I mentioned, Lauren and I are very much into safety. Um, I also teach people how to use a draw bar. So this goes through the headstock of the lathe, connects up with the, uh, with the mandrel and then pulls it into the lathe so it can't possibly come out. Um, there are also things I like to do like if I need to go to a, a belt grinder or, or a disc sander, I don't want to hold things in my hand um, because my fingers are short enough as they are. So I show people specialized tools that help hold the work and uh, things like that. The other thing is that when we uh, try to take these things and make them into jewelry, because once you've got the pieces, you want to make them into jewelry, um, I also show people how we use a, a drill press and a micrometer stand to drill very precise holes. So those are just some of the, the things that, uh, that we'll be dealing with. So I'm going to start with this piece here and you'll see that it's already been marked for the center. I've knocked off the corners and the second piece is gonna be uh, with a piece like this. So Lauren, I'm going to switch back to you and let's see, that would be number five. Number five. All right. So now number Lauren will show you a little nine. bit about where she's working. Okay. This is my work area. It's just this little portable piece of wood here with all these wonderful things attached. Okay, Alan was showing you the pendant backer plate. The pendants are attached by, um, by double-sided tape to a waste block. And this is part of the pendant backer plate. And I can, it's sitting on a, a, a ball head, a photographer's ball head so that I can actually remove this, take it outside. Part of my design and the fact that I like to work on top of what I'm working on is I use a workable fixative, um, which I'll talk a little bit about later, but um, I need to take it outside and spray it. And using this, I can just un undo it and it comes right off and I'll take it downstairs and spray it. And I have lights and I have cameras and computers everywhere and a whole bunch of of uh, pens like everywhere <laughs> it, it just keeps growing um i'm, I'm going to just show is... just for a moment lauren i'm just going to cut yeah. to me for a moment so uh this is as i mentioned i'm down in in our basement shop and i don't know how many of you have green screens behind you in your shop uh <laughs> up until about a year ago, I was the only one that had it, but now uh, a bunch of the demonstrators that I've trained uh, have gotten into green screens because this allows us to drop ourselves into uh, uh, the uh, pictures wherever we want. And um, 
so although you can't see it on camera at the moment, I've got my computers here, I've got uh, all sorts of switching. So I, I teach people how to do these demonstrations with all sorts of fun. Back to your regularly scheduled program. Lauren, <laughs> you're up. Yes, okay. Um, talking about pens, we were talking about that before and uh, I use archival ink pens and archival just means that it's not likely to fade over time. Um, and so there are certain pens that I like to use like the Copic Multiliner, the Faber-Castell and the Sigma Micron. They are all archival types of ink. The Faber-Castell is um, India ink and the Mi Sigma Micron is, uh, was specially designed for archival prints for museums. And uh, the multiliner pens are, they're all pigment based as opposed to dye-based pens and Copic make dye-based pens as well, which is more like watercolors. Um, you have to be careful when you're putting on a finish that you don't wipe off what you've done because dye-based does likes to wipe off. So um, the, the, the fact that they're alcohol pens means that they're blendable so you can blend different colors into them and you can uh, smooth out lines and stuff like that like that so that's what i'm using here let's see and then these are the sketch markers that are dye based and this is the fixative that i use um it's kind of like what the artists use for charcoal it's exactly like what the artists use for charcoal and pastel drawings what it does is it kind of sets the work that you've done it gives it a tooth so that the ink doesn't run all over the place and you can keep working on it over and over and over again. So let's go back to number one. Okay, this is what, whoops, hello pen, there we go. I started here, as I said, I was working in pencil first. Most of the time I don't, but this time I just wanted to to demonstrate that you can do that. And then what you can do is you just erase any of the pencil marks after you put in the, uh, the ink marks and it doesn't erase the ink, it just erases the pencil. However, you can erase the ink if you get to it in time. Um, and being an alcohol pen, you, uh, alcohol based pens, you can actually take alcohol and there's an alcohol pen that will erase whatever you did. It's colorless blender. That'll either blend or erase what, what your problem was, or you can file it off. So what I'm doing here is I would take it downstairs and spray it off right about now, but I'm gonna try doing it without it. So here I put in some green color with my Copic brush. And there are lots of different colors. So what you want to do is be very light with it and just put it in. Right. And I'm going to go see the other thing about this. And the reason I have it on a ball head is because this kind of design, you want to keep turning around because it's much easier. I'm on a, a wrist rest. What we're going to do is I want to uh, get to a little bit of turning. I'm going to put you into the picture in picture so that uh, okay, people then I'll can. Keep working on your yeah, you keep working right? on that. And I will just drop you into here. And then I'll just move this over a little bit so you can see Don't start what, I'm, what I'm working on. Yeah. So I uh, figure it's time to get to do a little bit of wood turning. So as I mentioned, the pieces that you can see I've got the uh, backer plate uh, mounted on the lathe here, and I'm going to be using uh, some tape. 
And this is a, a double-sided tape that is cloth backed and works really, really well. Uh, a lot of other tapes that I've used, I find myself having to fight. Uh, this stuff is just a pleasure to work with, and you don't. You, it is pressure activated, which means that when you put the piece on, you need to um, you need to press it in for the glue to actually activate. And so I've got these nice little uh, uh, slots that I made that fit in the um, fit in the. Let's put this here. That they fit in the um, uh, tailstock that I can now crank down and actually apply pressure to it. So this is actually only being held by the tape and the pressure of the tailstock on it. So when I do turning, um, I'm gonna be kind of gentle with it and I'm always gonna to turn towards the headstock. Now, there are a couple of things. One is that there are, for those of you that are not all that familiar with turning, there's a lot of different kinds of chisels and tools and such. I'm gonna be using um, some conventional tools depending on my mood um, or, I may be using uh, carbide tools. This is a cupped carbide cutter. And then we have things like this, and these are flat carbide cutters. For the jewelry stuff, I rather tend to use the carbide stuff. Um, it just uh, works very well for me. The other thing to note is that if I come over here, and again, if I pan left, um, as I mentioned, I do not turn on the lathe until I wear a respirator helmet. So my audio might get a little, um, a little loud. Um, if it does, uh, you let me know and I'll just turn down the microphone. So I have this attached to um, uh, an air supply. So the air is actually coming down, blowing over my face and out. So no uh, dust gets in. And you'll also hear me turn on the dust collector. Now this isn't ideal for a demonstration, but this is actually the way we work in our shop. So that's the reason I want to show it to you this way. So if the, um, um, let's see if we cut over here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn on the dust collector and I'm gonna rotate the lathe just to make sure that nothing is hitting the headstock. Uh, nothing is hitting the tool rest. And then I'm going to uh, just rough this to round. So really the wood, wood turning techniques I'm gonna be showing you are roughing to round. Now I'm not pushing in hard this way. I'm actually just kind of sweeping this way. And one of the ways you can tell if you're round is by resting your chisel on the top. And if it's bouncing, you're not round yet. And I wind up with, in this case, pink shavings all over my hand. So I'm just trying to make, get rid of the rough edges. I'll stop it and take a look. And I'm almost there. There's a pretty small piece of wood. Okay, so now that the, the ink, but now that the adhesive is set, I can move the tailstock out of the way. And what I'm gonna do is swing the tool rest around. And the idea here is now I wanna make this uh, convex. I want the uh, outside to have a curve to it. So in this case, I'm gonna take a, uh, a round carbide cutter and it can be used as a scraper or we can use it in uh, a kicked up angle like this uh, just to uh, make more of a shear cut. But all I'm doing is I wanna thin out the edges. So I'm gonna scrape first because the front isn't level. 
and I get to decide how thick I want to make this piece. So all I'm doing is trying to make this thinner towards the edges like this. And again, I can come in at an angle for more of a sheer cut. And that's about as far as I want to go at the moment because I'm just trying to show you the general technique. Then it would be time to sand it. So what is kind of interesting is that I made this, um, this thing called a sticky stick. It's like, let me turn off the dust collector for a moment. Um, this is a thing called a sticky stick. And all it is, is a, uh, a stick with Velcro on it. Uh, in fact, let me jump to camera six. It's a stick with Velcro on it and magnets. And the abrasives that I'm using are loop back so I can just stick them on here. And then I can just put them onto the lathe. I put them onto the bed of the lathe and this way the, uh, the, adhesive, the abrasives are always here and I can pull them off one at a time and uh, do them in order. So again, I turn on dust collector, I turn this on and I'm not gonna actually spend much time sanding this piece. Oh, help if I point the camera at it. I'm not gonna spend much time sanding the piece, but the idea here is that I would work my way through the grits and uh, uh, just go down each one of the grits. I started about 100 and I can work my way up to about 600. But it's very nice because I never get them out of order and uh, uh, takes up no room. And it's just very, very nice. So let's assume that I have done all of that. Now the thing is what I need to do is I need to drill a hole in it. Now there's any number of ways, I'll lift the, the shield here, there's any number of ways of drilling a hole. You could take it to the drill press and drill a hole, uh, but I like to give it a bit of a, a bevel. Um, so I'm just gonna show you uh, one of the features of uh, this pendant backer plate. And that is that if I take a drill and I put it in the chuck, Right now, it's going to drill a hole in the center. So we don't want to do that. But one of the things that you can do with these, this pendant backer plate is you can change it and make a different offset. So I'm going to try, say, hole number five here. So now as I spin this, you'll see it's kind of wobbling around, but it's wobbling around the new center. And that center is close to the edge. I'm gonna try that. I, may, I might break through the edge. If I do, then it ceases being a pendant and winds up being a nose ring. So, um, uh, but there's another problem. And that is that twist bits are notorious for wandering and uh, all sorts of other problems. So the solution to that is to use something called a center bit. And these are used by machinists. And what's nice is it's got a nice uh, thick shaft and it's really designed to drill uh, holes um, in bar stock so that you can put them uh, into the tail stock of a machinist lathe and hold the, the piece in place. But what's nice about this is that uh, it has a, its own little bevel on it and this works out very, very well. So let me put down my face shield, turn on my dust collector, and set the speed down to maybe 250 RPM. Again, I always spin it first. So now if I move in, it should bore the hole. And make a countersink or make a nose ring.
Let me just go just a little bit further. There's a rule in, uh, in wood turning. There's a rule in wood turning that says under no circumstances ever make that last cut because it was that last cut is where you blew up the piece or flew off the lathe or the piece broke and all of that. But this is uh, an example of a way to drill a hole offset from center. Now, the other thing that's really cool and one of the, the real joys of woodworking is when we take a piece like this, which looks kind of plain and you know it's been dyed maple, it's that moment when you put a finish on it that the grain starts to pop. And I'm just gonna be using this stuff for this demo called uh, Triple E Ultra Shine, which is a Triple E Rouge in a wax base. So I'm just gonna take a little bit of this and put it on here and then uh, just buff it a bit. And we'll see the grain start to come out. So if I come over here, I didn't turn on the dust collector, but my face shield is down. Again, I don't want things to go flying off the lathe. Remember, this is only being held on by tape. And aside from the fact that it's got um, stuff in the hole here, this is what this piece would look like. And if it's a really pretty piece of wood, I think my microphone was outside my helmet there. If it's a really pretty piece of wood, now you can start seeing uh, all of the, the grain and what's going on in the wood. So this is piece number one. So that's the most basic pendant turning uh, technique. And then what I need to do is I need to take the piece off of the lathe and the trick here is coming in behind it and gently prying it off. Uh, the adhesive is actually very, very strong, but you can get it off and, uh, and then peel off the tape and then use uh, a solvent if there's any adhesive left on the tape. Let us check in with Lauren to see how she's doing. So I'm going to take out Lauren here and see Lauren. Hi, Lauren. Hi. Are you okay? We're still doing this. Okay, so I am giving it some dimension here by adding some shading, some shadows. And I have actually blended some of my purple ink over here with the red by just adding the red ink on top of it. So if I just went over here and added some more purple, I can take my red ink and kind of blend it and smooth it out a little bit so I don't have this harsh line coming through. So that's an example of, of some of the blending that you can do with these pens. And then of course I have to uh, just wipe it off a little bit so that it's it's still red and not whatever that purple was. So I've been going around my trees. And as you see, I've been going around and around and around. Okay, the other thing I wanna mention is if I throw myself into here, can I throw myself? In? Yes, good. I am wearing a head mounted micro, uh, a head mounted, oh boy, I just lost the, um, magnifier, magnifier. Thank <laughs> you. Boy, that was a senior moment there for a second. Um, the, these are wonderful. Uh, they allow me to see really close up without straining my eyes, which is important to me. So, uh, that's, uh, something that I'm happy about. And so that's what I'll do. And then I am going to, the next time you do whatever you're doing, Alan, I am going to uh, go downstairs and spray because <laughs> I need to spray. All right. Well, this? what I'm going to do is uh, just set up for the next piece here. And you are, so okay. as, as Lauren is drawing, 
Um, you can see me in picture in picture here. I'm just setting up for the next piece, doing exactly what I did before, except this time with a piece of maple. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to show you uh, the kind of piece that, that Lauren is working on, a piece with a raised bead. And so I will take my piece here. and center it on the lathe. And put my helmet back on as I walked into the other room. All right, uh, Lauren, are you uh, ready to, uh, to go and spray or do you need a few more minutes? Yeah, I can, I can do that if you want. Okay. So what I'm no doing problem. here then is I'm going to uh, take this out. I'm going to uh, go back to the overhead camera. Put down my face shield, turn on the dust collector. I think maybe I'll use a different kind of chisel just for the, uh, for the sport of it. I'll use a conventional chisel. So this is a conventional chisel, a spindle gouge. And once again, I'm just gonna rough it around and then uh, do a little uh, arc on the front. And this one's substantially larger diameter than the first one, which was only about an inch and a quarter. This one's I think two and a half inches. And it's kind of nice to have shavings coming off. When it's not round, you get chips. And when it becomes round, you get shavings. So here I'm writing the bevel, which is something you will hear woodturners say a lot. And so now we are round. And I will just pull the, uh, pull the tool rest out of the way and just brush up the back a little bit. Okay, so now I take this out of the way. Um, and uh, Lauren, are, are you back or you haven't left yet? You haven't left yet. No, I'm back. Oh, you're back. Okay, good. All right. It flash dries by the time I get upstairs, it's ready to work on. Yeah. All right. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to do just these two things, and then we're actually going to be done with the wood turning. Um, and we can just talk uh, uh, to Lauren uh, about the, all the rest of it. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to rough this to round. I'm going to arc this just a little bit. It's really not all that important. I just want to thin out the edges a little bit because you'll see what I'm going to do in a minute. So I, I've got the, so the center and I want to raise this and just thin this out just a little. Not much. Now, the thing here is that I want to do a raised bead. And the question is, well, what is a raised bead? Well, there's a wonderful line that says, the way you make a statue of an elephant is to start with a big block of marble and just chip away everything that doesn't look like an elephant. So what I'm going to do here is I am going to cut a bead in here. And you can see this is a beading tool. And see if I go over here, you might be able to see it a little better. Uh, this is one version of a beading tool. This one isn't sold anymore. Most beading tools have um, the, the channel running down the length of the shaft. This one goes across the shaft. So this one's done differently. Most of them you would use like this. This one gets used upside down. And so if I just double check here. Okay. So when I run this, let me turn on the dust collector. What I'm gonna do is rock it back and forth.
So now we have a bead, but it's not a raised bead. It's not above the surface. It's the top of the bead is at the surface. So there's any number of ways of dealing with this. And one is that I could come in with a spindle gouge and just kind of, um, kind of come in like this with a spindle gouge. But that makes it more difficult to try to get the stuff out of the center. So what I'm trying to do is carve away everything that doesn't look like an elephant. In this case, I'm going to use a flat square carbide bit. Now, there'll be some tear out because I'm working face grain here, but a little bit of sanding will get rid of that. And what I'm doing here is I am uh, going to come in at an angle because I want the edges to be a little thinner than, than the center. But I need to, to go down and get rid of material to the bottom of the bead. because I don't want the, uh, the groove where the end of the, the teeth of the beading tool came in. But that's, that's pretty close. I like these to be fairly thin. And now I'm gonna come in the other side and do exactly the same thing. And I'm gonna leave the center a little higher than the, uh, than the edges because I kind of like this sort of domed effect on the center. So again, it's, I cut a bead and I'm cutting away everything to the left and the right of the bead. Now this isn't particularly hard maple, so there's some tear out, but here's where we use our, our uh, uh, 100 grit gouge, as they call it where maybe I'll start, yeah, I'll start with a hundred. And this is uh, called Abernet. It's very nice in that it doesn't clog up. So I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna go on the inside here. And I'm not gonna spend much time doing this, uh, but I just wanna show you the steps. And then I would go to the next grit and the next grit. and ease this over a little bit. Once I've done all of that, I'm gonna uh, take it over to another device here. Let me see if I get this, uh, get this wire out of the way and show it to you. Let me just straighten the camera here. If I switch over to this camera here, what I can do is I can take the I can take this over here and what I've got are these things called sanding mops and I can bring them here and I can actually uh, sand them very nicely. Um, got moving from grit to grit to grit and they get into all the little nooks and crannies. Um, and so when that is done, we wind up with uh, with a, a piece with a raised bead. You'll see it's a pretty thin piece and that's why I use that uh, uh, drill press to drill very precision holes in here to use for screw eyes or, or pins or whatever. But this is an example of how someone would take um, a bead and make it raised. That's just one technique. Again, the tools that I use and the techniques that I use vary mostly depending on my mood and uh, what I'm trying to accomplish for us, being in the shop is fun. It, it's something we enjoy doing. And it's not, uh, it's not our, our job currently. And so uh, for me, experimenting with different tools and techniques and such is, uh, is, is great fun. And we enjoy teaching other uh, wood turners how to do this. So I'm gonna switch back over to Lauren because the wood turning portion of this is finished. And if somebody has a, a club that they want us to demonstrate to, to show actually a detail about this, uh, let us know. And uh, Lauren, I'm gonna switch back over to you. Lauren. Okay.
All right, I'm on. <laughs> okay, so now you can you can drop yourself into the corner. It'd be nice to have you on screen. All right, hold on one second. I gotta get this thing on my belt again. Alrighty, drop myself in. Nope, wrong oh, one. Sorry, wrong one. Okay. Go so back and and press. One. I got it. There you go. I can do this. I can do this. <laughs> All right. So <clears throat> one thing to note about these pens is that it's not like doing oil paints or acrylics where you can actually color light colors on top of dark colors. It's really hard to do with these ink pens. Uh, you have to do dark uh, think about what you're going to do with the dark colors and uh, you can't you can put dark over light but you can't put light over dark so what I'm doing is I'm using this pen which is a gel pen and I'm adding little dots here just to add um, maybe a feeling of gassy kind of stuff and what I'm going to do is I'm going to move dots up into each of the trees so that it looks like they're getting the CO2. So that's my plan. See what happens with that. So you know, Lauren, we could we could have made a Halloween theme because CO2 uh, when frozen, you know, makes nice foggy kinds of effects, you know, uh, for Ooh, put in could have taken a, a pendant put it inside a pumpkin in Halloween or something. Yeah, that's that's totally ridiculous. Okay. Yeah, well, um, what then? <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> these these gel pens are a little bit funky in that um, I'm trying to do dots with them. Uh, let me see if I can show you some dots with my gel pen. So these worked out really, really well on top of the dark. With my and just adds another dimension, maybe a you know a sci-fi dimension. Ooh. Um, so put that back. Uh, the only thing with the gel pens is that they clog easily. So I'm trying to just get them to, to put little dots in here and let's see if it'll actually do it. Come on, little guy. There we go. We're starting. So I will get to that a little later because it's a pain in the you know what. Um, Another thing that I was thinking about doing, so we'll do the dots in there, but maybe to add more interest to the outside, I can shadow that with trees. Maybe I'll add a bird or two also. Let's see. If I shadow the trees just by doing a line here around the tree, like that. So Lauren, okay. while you're doing that, yes. um, mm -hmm. let me uh, just show the uh, a video or two uh, that will, let me see if I can find it, um, that shows, say, how you turn some of this into jewelry. So the first one I'll show is a little 40 second video uh, about a jump ring. And so Lauren, why don't you continue working on this? I'll na narrate the jump ring. Um, and okay. this has got, Talk this about is got, what they do. Yeah. So this has got to do with the way you connect things together. Um, so once you have this piece of wood, well, how are you going to turn it into a necklace? Well, one way would be to uh, drill a hole and put a little screw eye on the top. Um, and then you would connect a necklace to it using something called a jump ring. So if I uh, just show you this here. So this is... Uh, we did this video of Lauren uh, opening a jump ring. They're just a little split ring. Because so what you what you do is you use kind of a push and pull approach where you just twist it a little bit and it opens up. You never and, twist it, Alan. Yeah, well, you never pull it. So meanwhile, you you're you're <laughs> you twisting you're twisting together. Yeah. You're you're just twisting the edges apart and then twisting them back together again. 
and uh, as opposed to pulling them apart, looking for a gap. So that's all you need to do. And that's the way you would connect, say, uh, uh, a finding. Another the reason that, that we made yeah. the video is because it was impossible to do that looking at the camera at the same time and trying to get it in the exact right uh, direction so yeah. that you can and, watch that. And so here you'll see that there's a, uh, there's a pin back. This is one of the ways that Lauren likes to uh, make this into jewelry. So uh, what we have here is, in fact, we'll show you what not to do. We left it in the video just because, uh, pay attention. <laughs> and so what this is, is you have the back of the wood and um, you'll see the, the pin back is a, a little piece of hardware that has a hanger on the top so you can run a necklace through it or it's got, and it's got a pin so you can use it as a brooch. And so what she'll do is she'll uh, rough it up just a little bit, rough up the back of it a little bit because she's gonna be putting it on with a, a super glue and, and the glue that she's using uh, has a gel consistency. And uh, one thing that we didn't do is we didn't test this one. This is a brand new tube. And uh, <laughs> you'll see what happens. You should actually take a little bit the first time you use the tube and put it onto a, uh, a piece of uh, paper. Well, what happened here was when she let this out, it splooched out all over the place here. And so there she was saying, Alan, I, I, need, I need a toothpick. I need something to clean this up. And I said, no, let's just keep this in the video because it's going to happen to somebody else. And let's not, let's let them know, don't do this. So uh, she puts this down onto the wood. You'll see there's some squeeze out there. And then you would take some, uh, uh, something and clean out the squeeze out. And then you let it uh, cure. And it's actually a very nice way of uh, of mounting things so uh lauren i'm going to switch back over to you and then we can wrap it up you are okay because it looks like my gel pens are not being cooperative so okay we're getting there this is the kind of thing that i will get back to um, I'll let it go for a little while and see if I actually wanted to do something more with it. What I do want to do is add the little dots to show the CO2 coming up into the trees. Um, and uh, I think well, there, there will be a, there, all I'm going to do at the moment. Yeah, there will be a lot of yes. detail because and now it's, it, it still looks a little bit cartoony. And as she adds oh, more detail so to more. it, yeah, as, as she adds more detail to it, um, it gets more and more interesting, more and more depth. Uh, you you want to look at it because people do look at um, at jewelry close up, and uh, uh, one of the dangers of watching Lauren work is I come over and I say, "Well, I, I just don't think that you know it's there yet." And she says, "No, I'm not close to it being there yet." So so uh, uh, only when she tells me that it's done, then is when I will say, "Oh, well, maybe it needs this or that." Um, but uh, she's got a really good sense of it. In this case, what's nice about this is that there's enough wood showing through. So this isn't a piece of plastic that this is on. This is wood and she'll, there'll, there'll be lots of detail and texture and things like that, which will be uh, uh, very nice. So I don't see any eventually. particular questions uh, uh, in the YouTube chat. Uh, again, this is more like if we were at a World Wood Day in fact, let me go back to uh, to our uh, uh, two up shot. Nice. This is like as if we were demonstrating at World Wood Day and, and you got hundreds of people walking by and people are just kind of saying, what's going on over here? And you talk to them and such, which is a very nice way of, of working. Um, I am delighted that we are uh, demonstrating for uh, World Wood Day and that people will be able to see this and, and be on the uh, World Wood Day uh, yeah. channel. And uh, Lauren, you have any, uh, any closing words aside from the fact that we're really sad that it got canceled in Tokyo and we're really happy that it's happening here now? Yeah, um, well, if you're interested in playing, there are all sorts of books that you can look at. 
there's a modality called Zentangle, which is a de design uh, modality that uh, basically there are different sections called strings that you can put different designs into. And uh, there's all sorts of fun things you can do. And it's just very Zen and very fun and, and uh, I love doing it. Yeah, the, a lot of this, particularly what Lauren is doing, you could think of as sort of directed doodling is we, we've got some areas and I want to fill in different shapes and patterns and things like that. Lauren finds it very relaxing. She can do it while she's you know listening to a podcast or watching TV. Um, you don't need a lot of equipment to get started. And it's, it's sort of her, her signature way of, of working. And so we hope that uh, some of you found this uh, entertaining and um, we certainly enjoy doing the demonstration and look forward to uh, the rest of the World Wood Day wood turning demonstrators who are helping to kick off this uh, virtual event. So thank you everyone, stay safe, stay healthy, thank you. and yeah. wood, wood is good. <laughs>